Good morning, friends, and happy Easter. Our staff here at First Church would like to send you a special message this morning. Hi, everyone. Happy Easter. We miss you here at First Church and hope everybody is well. Hi, happy Easter. We miss you. I can't wait till we gather together again to worship and just please stay safe and healthy. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to everyone. We miss you terribly and can't wait to get together and worship as a family. God bless you. Happy Easter, everyone, and good morning. I'm so happy to be able to greet you all. I miss being able to do that in person and can't wait till we can all worship God together again. Happy Easter, everybody. Miss you all terribly. Can't wait until we get to sing God's praises in the sanctuary again. Please stay safe. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. We miss seeing all of you in person and can't wait until we're together again to celebrate. Happy Easter to you all. And this was a film while we are having a STEM meeting today. And our hearts are together with you and staffs are still working hard. Be safe, everybody, and have a blessed day. Good morning, friends, and happy Easter to you as we gather on this day of resurrection here at First United Methodist Church. Of course, we're not gathered in the church this morning because of the COVID-19 situation, the pandemic that we find ourselves in. But we are certainly gathered in, in spirit on this day when we celebrate that the tomb is empty because that makes our lives filled. And, and Jesus has been raised. He is risen, we say, and we respond, he is risen indeed. So I hope you enjoy this Easter service. We have special music planned. We have, of course, scripture to be read, and I'll be offering a message that's entitled Resurrection in Two Acts in just a few moments. And also, of course, we'll be celebrating virtual communion today. So if you haven't had a chance to gather bread and juice or wine or whatever it is that you would like to represent body and blood of Christ, through virtual communion. I invite you to uh, take a moment and do that if you haven't done that already. That'll come at the end of the service this morning. So uh, I remind us all just to stay safe during this time, uh, stay in your homes when at all possible, just for essential reasons. You, you, uh, you should go out and if you're in those vulnerable categories, we in the church are here to help as well. And, and please stay connected too. We try to stay connected through Facebook Live. I'm offering messages uh, during uh, the weekdays, uh, as well as people just making phone calls to one another and just connecting in that way. And a lot of email going back and forth, I see. And it's just wonderful to see the church family doing that. So we are staying connected through uh, this uh, difficult time that we're, we're going through. But we need to stay safe, friends. We need to stay at home. We need to remain in our homes. And that's very important for us to continue to do that. Easter means hope, and we raise hope in this time that the future will not always be like this. We know that God will see us through, and, and we will find our way out. So let's begin our service on this Easter Sunday, this glorious day of resurrection. Let's start with a word of prayer. I invite you to enter into this time now. God of life, you have caused the tomb to be empty, and you've caused the tomb to be empty so that our lives may be filled with good things. And so we've gathered on this Easter Sunday, even though we're not together in body, we are together in spirit. And God, we praise your holy name and we worship you as those who rejoice in this wonderful promise that you've given us, the promise of resurrection. And God, as we gather, we, we leave the days of Lent behind. They were long days this year, oh God, really long days of Lent, a Lent unlike any other. But we gather this morning in this bright and glorious day, and, and it is the day of resurrection, a day when we hear your words of life, not just for our futures, but also for our present nows, our present moments. And God, as followers of the risen Christ, we claim for ourselves the words of Scripture that we hear this morning echoing from that empty tomb, that he is risen. He is risen indeed. And so like Christ, oh God, we, we rise. We rise from whatever circumstances that may be getting in the way of what you've created us to be, we rise from all those mistakes that we've made in the past, the, the wrong turns, the painful pathways that can so easily burden us, oh God. We, we rise from the ways of sin and the ways of death that our world often deals in. And we reject the idea that these things have the last word on who we are and who we shall be, who you want us to be in the future. Because on this day of resurrection, oh God, that means that our lives are forever linked with the risen Christ. Love wins on this day, oh God. Your love wins on this day. And we claim that for ourselves. 
And as those who rise with Christ, we remember today that the new life you offer in Jesus, that's always available to us. Remind us, O oh God, on this day through the empty tomb, that our lives are continually filled with the possibilities of your spirit, your Holy Spirit working within our spirits. And that as Easter people, you revive us, you renew us, you restore us, O oh God, so that we can be agents of resurrection, not just so that we can tell the good news, but so we can be the good news. We can live the good news for a world that is, is in such pain. And in that spirit, O oh God, we pray for revival. We pray for renewal. We pray for restoration in the lives of those who are, who are just aching, O oh God, for some sort of relief. We pray out of compassion for them, our sense that their pain and suffering, that doesn't reflect your will, not at all. That's not your will for them or for any of your children. And so we pray for this, the larger needs of our world and our community, and we, we think about this crisis that we're in the midst of right now, oh God, this pandemic. We just pray your spirit would see us through this time in the valley so that we can reach the mountaintop one, once again. We pray for the dream of peace, oh God, in our world, of peace and nonviolence. We pray for the hope that, that we can end hunger and poverty and that people will have enough food to eat around our world. And for the desire to provide shelter and safety for people, the basic needs, human rights that all persons are entitled to. God, we pray for this world that you so loved, that you sent us Jesus, that his death on the cross and his resurrection in a garden that might restore all of creation to what you intend for it to be. May we claim this message anew again today, O oh God, on this Easter Sunday, and may we see the hope that you give us, that we will get through this time, this time when the virus just seems to be at its peak, O oh God, but that there is a new day, there is light, there is hope, there is resurrection. So all this we pray in the strong and in the healing name of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, Amen. Happy Easter to you, everyone. Today's reading from Psalm comes from Psalm 118, verse 14 through 29. Listen to the word of the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. And right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live. And recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me solely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, who has given us light. Lead the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, who is good, for the steadfast love endures forever. The word of the Lord. Amen.
name Victory forever Is the song of the redeemed I know that my Redeemer lives And now I stand on what He did My Savior, my Savior lives Every day a brand new chance to say Jesus, you are the only way My Savior, my Savior lives Easter Sunday, we have scripture this morning to share, and uh, we're going to take Luke's version this morning of the resurrection of Jesus from the 24th chapter, actually, and beginning in the first verse, going through 12 verses in chapter 24. So listen to Luke's version of this story. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has been risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to, to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed, amazed at what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we just pray this morning that these words would find a, a welcome place in our hearts as we reflect on, on Luke's version of this story this morning. So I just want to start out uh, with my message this morning by asking a simple question. I know you can't respond, of course, because all this is virtual, but how many of you think at home, how many of you play an instrument or had played an instrument in the past? 
Now, for those of you who do, I want you to think back to when you first started playing that particular instrument. Now, chances are you had a teacher, right? Maybe it was your parents, maybe it was a professional teacher, maybe somebody else in your family or friends. But what did that teacher always say to you? Probably over and over and over again. I bet that teacher always said to you, practice, 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 right? That's the mantra when you're learning almost anything, but particularly an in instrument. And why would your teacher say that to you? Because another, another saying is practice makes perfect. You've heard that many times before. But practice, uh, practice usually isn't a whole lot of fun, is it? Nah, not so much. It's boring. It could be repetitious. It's, uh, it's just not a lot of fun. And, and, and when you're learning to play an instrument, it can be this never-ending monotony of notes and scales and chords when really all you want to do is you want to play a song, right? That's the whole goal of playing an instrument. You want to play some music. And so that's probably why video games, like, uh, think back in the day, like Guitar Hero when it first came out, or Rock Band, one of those, uh, one of those games that were hugely popular when they first came out, probably still are, because in those games you don't have to practice at all. You, you just play the song. That's what you do. And you don't even need a real guitar to play, right? It comes with a fake guitar in a sense. But you got to play the song, you see, and that's, that's the difference. And of course, the same thing is true when it comes to singing or playing a sport or, or even preaching. <laughs> Believe me, that's the case. You deserve, sure, I've heard some of my first sermons. I won't, uh, I won't torture you with that. But the more you do something, you see, the better you get at it. And, it's, and so if you want to do something with, with real excellence, you have to keep working at it. You have to keep practicing. So a couple years ago, uh, a book came out. And it was called How to Get Published and Make a Lot of Money. Maybe you've heard of this book. It was written by the same author, Susan Page, who wrote another book, which was uh, called If I'm So Wonderful, Why Am I Single? Which is a great title for a book, I think. But the book on getting published was kind of unusual because it outlined these 20 steps that you should take if you want to get rich in the literary world. And so I'll just give you a couple. I won't go through them all. But step four, for instance, uh, step four said that Start working on a fabulous title. That was step four. Start working on a fabulous title. Step seven was uh, kind of interesting as well. Choose a fabulous photo of yourself for the back cover. And then there was step 10. Enlist the help of a fabulous literary agent. I, I guess uh, Ms. Page liked the word fabulous a lot. She seemed to use it often. But of the 20 steps, step 12 would seem to be the most important, it seems to me. Because step 12, very simply, is write a book. Write a book. Now, it's all a bit tongue-in-cheek, of course, but what Susan Page is suggesting is that if you want to be successful in writing a book, you should practice writing it by doing all these other steps as well. Almost like fake it till you make it type of thing, right? It's like you're seeing yourself as an author even before you become one. Now, Jesus, in a much, much more subtle way, is suggesting, I think, something similar to us on this Easter morning. Because resurrection, you see, isn't just about a future promise, is it? A promise that we kind of passively wait for in the world to come. Resurrection is also about a present possibility for our lives right here, right now. It's about seeing yourself, in a sense, as a resurrected person already. It's about... It's about seeing yourself in this way, and the way that you do that, of course, is by practicing resurrection, doing that in your daily life as a, as a committed person, a follower of Jesus. So you might be thinking to yourself right about now, okay, Pastor, so how do I go about practicing resurrection exactly? Well, it might be helpful for us just to think for a moment about that other resurrection account that appears in the Gospel of John. Maybe you remember it very well. It's the story of Lazarus. So you may remember how in that story, Jesus arrives on the scene a little too late to prevent Lazarus from dying. And the gospel even hints that Jesus may have done this on purpose as a way to show God's glory is being revealed through his miraculous work. The raising of Lazarus may be one of many signs, as the gospel of John calls them. But even if that's not the case, I think it becomes pretty clear that Lazarus' death is not the end of the story. And so Jesus approaches the tomb in this story, approaches the tomb of his good friend, and in this dramatic moment, he commands Lazarus to come out. Which, miraculously, that's exactly what happens. Lazarus comes out. But you see, that's just the beginning. 
That, that's just the first act in the drama, because whenever there is resurrection in the Gospels, friends, it always comes in, in two acts. There's this unexplainable miracle on the one hand, the miracle of resurrection. I mean, Lazarus is clearly alive when he was once dead. He's, he's now standing there in front of everyone, and he's still bound in his burial wrappings. But then there's this second act. Jesus turns to his disciples, and what does he say to them? He says, eh, you unwrap them. You unwrap them. He tells them to complete the work that he started. You see, friends, there's also a, a very human element to the story that says that, that the miracle isn't fully completed until all of us, as followers of Jesus, get involved in some way. Lazarus was alive, but he was still bound by the, the trappings of death. And that only changed once the disciples got involved, once the disciples freed him. I mean, this is a really powerful image. When you, you think about it, it's as if Jesus is saying to them, you have a part in this. You play a, a role in this. You have to practice what I've showed you as something that is to be lived out right now, right in this moment. So go ahead. You go do it. You go finish things up here. Unwrap Lazarus and, and complete what I've already started. So there is this act, this first act, act one, which of course is the miracle itself. But then there is this equally important act two. And that is the role of those who would follow Jesus. By completing the miracle, by practicing resurrection in their daily lives. And so, friends, in all the gospel accounts of Easter, what we find is a similar pattern going on. I mean, here in Luke's version, I just read for you a few moments ago, Mary Magdalene and, and Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and some other women are on their way to the tomb with some spices that they have prepared for the body. But when they get there, what do they see? The stone has been rolled away and, and the body is, is nowhere to be found. And that's when these two, these two men in dazzling white clothes appear to them and they remind the women of what Jesus had told them. Then on the third day, he would rise again. And so then the women return from the tomb and they tell all of, of Jesus' followers who are gathered together what they've experienced. And, and it's from this point on that, that if a stage curtain were present on this scene, it'd be time for the curtain to come down. Because Act 1 is over and Act 2 is just getting ready to start. The miracle of resurrection, you see, it isn't fully completed until the followers of Jesus get involved. Until they, they, they put into practice what Jesus has shown them as something that has to be lived out. It must be lived out. Now, the first thing that the disciples do when the, the women tell them what they've experienced is, well, you know, they don't believe it. They dismiss what these women have to say. I, I guess you could say typical men, right? They call the, the women's witness an idle tale. It's an idle tale. So if you're going to take a moment for, for the curtain to, to come up on Act 2, that's what's going to happen. It's just going to take a few moments. But then it starts with Peter, doesn't it? Luke tells us that it's Peter who makes the first move. He runs to the tomb. And even though he doesn't see Jesus yet, he nevertheless believes. So because of the witness of, of these women, Peter actually becomes the first Christian convert, if you will. And it's going to be through his witness and the witness of the others that this story will be told over and over and over again. So the first step then in practicing resurrection requires that we tell the story as well. That's up to us to do in practicing resurrection. It requires that we share the faith of the empty tomb. And that's the faith that says that death and sin and, and separation from God, those things don't have to be the final word on us. God has the final word. God has the last say. And because God has the final word, that means that, friends, we have nothing to fear. We have to remember that throughout this whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we find ourselves in. Yeah, it's difficult. Yes, it's a valley experience for us, as I keep calling it. And yes, people are dying and people we know are dying. But God will have the final word on this, and God will see us through. And we will come out on the other side, and we have nothing to fear because of that. You see, there is always hope with God. We've got to remember that. 
There's always hope with God. Pastor He Young had a wonderful sermon uh, two weeks ago that said just that. There is always hope. And that's because in the end, as I mentioned in the prayer a few moments ago, the love of God wins. Love wins. That's another way to describe Easter. Love wins. Now that to me is a story that is worth practicing, isn't it? But it isn't just about mouthing the words, he is risen, right? It's not just about that. As I said, practicing resurrection also requires that we live out the story as well. And that's what the disciples did when they unwrapped Lazarus. They, they showed in a very visual type of way through their actions that resurrection is real and it's tangible and it's, it's present. It's a present possibility in our lives right now. That, that we're not bound by our, our past or we're not bound by our presence either. By following through, you see, on Jesus' command to unwrap Lazarus, those disciples on that day became agents of resurrection. And they were showing the world what's possible when God brings new life to those places in our lives that were once dead and buried. And yeah, we all have places like that, don't we? And those places need to be raised. And of course, the same thing is, is true for Easter. That's not just the case with the story of Lazarus. It's also true for Easter. Once Act 1 was accomplished and the tomb was found to be, to be empty, Act 2 then kicks into high gear. And guess what? Act 2, friends, continues to this very day. Jesus is still calling us. And Jesus is calling us to unwrap whatever it is that's binding not only us, but also those around us. What's binding us and those around us to the ways of sin and the ways of, of death. See, God is still calling us today to be agents of resurrection. And not just through our words as Easter people, but also just through the way we live our lives as Easter people. Our daily lives. Because, you know, sometimes words, words just fall a bit short. They don't quite measure up. And so whenever we take the time and we, we listen to a person who's going through a rough period in their lives and maybe someone is really feeling alone and isolated during this whole pandemic and, and somehow we can offer them a word of hope, that's when we're being agents of resurrection. Whenever we see someone who's heading down a very dangerous path and we can see that they're, they're just getting caught up in these destructive ways of living and, and, and we help them you know, to walk out of the darkness and, and into the light, so to speak, we're being agents of resurrection. We get a phone call, a phone call from a friend who huh, maybe is just beyond distraught because someone near and dear to them has, has suddenly died and, and we drop everything and, and we go to be by their side or these days we drop everything and we make a, a phone call and we just listen. And we're even just present in that moment. It's not so much what we say, it's more our presence in that moment. We are being agents. Of resurrection when we do that. When we feed the hungry, when we clothe the naked, when we, we visit the lonely, even through a phone call, or we welcome the stranger in our midst, or we extend grace, or we offer peace, or we, we show compassion, or whatever it is we might do as followers of, of Jesus, we're being agents of resurrection. We are unwrapping whatever it is that's binding that other person to the ways of death and preventing them from experiencing new life. We're sharing the story of our faith in the empty tomb. We're completing that miracle that God has already started. You know, one of the great thinkers of the late Middle Ages is Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas used to say that we Christians, we're not just living witnesses of the risen Christ. We're also loving witnesses of the risen Christ. I really like that. In other words, we just don't remember and we, we celebrate resurrection as something that we're, we're told happened a, a long time ago. No, we see it and, and we claim it and we celebrate it now as a part of what God is continuing to do in our lives and what God is continuing to do in our world. And so Easter, Easter is our way of saying that Jesus just didn't defeat death once. Jesus defeats death every day in every situation for, for every person who is reaching out of the darkness and, and searching for the light. And Jesus relies on us, friends. Jesus relies on his followers to spread that good news and to help put an exclamation point on it. 
Because the truth is, is that when we practice resurrection in this way, friends, when we see ourselves as, as resurrected people already, the tomb may stay empty, yes, but our hearts don't. Our hearts don't stay empty. We are Easter people. And we have a role in filling that once empty space that's inside all of us with the possibilities for a fresh start, the possibilities of a new beginning, the possibilities of a, of a rebirth of hope. And it isn't just about some future promise that we're passively waiting for in the world to come. It's also about what is possible for our lives right now. And so, friends, resurrection comes to us this day in, in two acts. There's the miraculous piece that in some ways, you know, is just beyond our, our comprehension. But then there's also the real and the tangible and, dare I say, the incarnate side of resurrection. That side that challenges us to be agents of it, agents in the world. So do you believe you can be that? On this Easter morning, do you believe that you can be agents of resurrection in people's lives? Can you calm fears? Can you be that listening ear? Can you be that person who thinks outside the box to, to connect with someone who's going through a particularly hard time, a time of isolation, a time of fear as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic? Can you be that person for someone else? Can you be an agent of, of resurrection? Can you proclaim this best of all news and perhaps help complete what God has started? Sure you can. Sure you can. All it takes is a little practice. Amen. Friends, now as we come behind the table for this joyous day of Thanksgiving, we celebrate the sacrament of communion together. Even though we can't be together physically, we are here in spirit at this table. If you've not already done so, I invite you to have your communion elements out at home and join in this sacrament with me as we read these important words, these words of institution, the great Thanksgiving for this Easter day. We start by saying that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, or earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. And I offer these words on behalf of all of us, be in a time of prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And so that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are forgiven. Amen. The Lord be with you, and we reply, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, and again we reply, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image, and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. 
You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And together we say, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. And together we say, Christ has died, Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and in our homes and pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And together we say, Amen. And now let us join together in that prayer, wherever you may be at home, that prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the bread of life, the body of Christ that has been broken for the life of the world. And this is the cup of covenant, the blood of Christ, shed for you and for me and for the life of the world. Be present at our table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adored. Thy creatures bless and grant that we may feast in paradise with thee. Amen. The table is ready. Christ is our host. This is an open table to all who desire to receive this sacrament, whether here in this room or in your homes. You are most welcome now to take your bread, dip it in your cup, and receive Jesus in this way, and may the Spirit speak to you anew, and the grace of God be with you in this moment.
body and the blood of Christ shed for you and for me and for the life of the world. Let's pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
And now, friends, may you go forward on this joyous day of resurrection. And even though we cannot be together in body, know that we are together as the church. We are together in spirit. And know that resurrection comes in two acts. It's not just something that we wait for. It is something that's a present reality for us. It enlivens us. It lifts us up. And we are witnesses to that resurrection and how we go out into this world. And we all serve in the name of Jesus Christ. So go, therefore, to serve on this Easter Sunday, practicing resurrection in your daily life. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you on this day of resurrection and always. And all of God's beloved Easter people said, Amen.